Welcome to the material review for describing network functions and equipment. Now that we've gotten through the content, I want to run through a few questions and discuss the answers with you, but I want to make sure that you do one thing. As I go through and read the questions, I'm going to pause for two or three seconds before I cover the answers. I want you to pause as well, think through what your answer would be and why it would be that, then hit the play button to hear me discuss it. That's how you really get the value out of it. You ready? Let's get started. Question number one. When a hub receives a signal, it regenerates that signal to all attached devices. True or false? The answer is true. That's one of the big drawbacks of a hub is it's simply a physical device that regenerates signals. When you move up to a switch, you have the ability to separate those ports into collision domains, which gives them the full bandwidth of that connection and allows multiple devices to talk at the same time. Question number two. A switch learns the blank of each attached device. The answer is D. I looked at C and I thought, I hope nobody answered that. The MAC address. That is actually a layer two address, talking about the OSI model, that the switch learns as soon as the device begins to communicate. These two are functions of a switch, but they actually have nothing to do with what the switch learns. Question number three. What are the two frequencies used by wireless access points, WAPs, to communicate in today's networks? Choose two. The answer is C and D. 2.4 and 5 gigahertz are the prevailing radio frequencies. We didn't get too much into those when we were going through this introductory material and why we would choose one over the other. That'll come in a later skill. For now, just know that those are the two primary frequencies that we use to communicate. I threw these two out there because those are also known as unlicensed frequencies. You see a lot of old cordless phones that use those. The beauty of the lower frequency, and by the way, I'm talking specifically about 900 megahertz, is it actually transmits farther but has less bandwidth than the higher frequencies. And just so you know, megahertz and gigahertz works the same way as megabyte and gigabyte. A gigahertz is a thousand megahertz. And I gotta laugh at this one. I just gotta say it. Marty, 1.21 gigawatts. If you don't know what that means, you got to do some movie trivia. Question number four. What is a wireless channel? The answer is A, a smaller slice of a larger group of radio frequency. We use the word channel to kind of humanize it because it gets pretty complex when you start slicing up radio frequencies into smaller spectrums. It has nothing to do with security. There's nothing physical about it. Well, I guess you could debate that. Anyway, it has nothing to do with the boundary. And it doesn't limit how many devices can connect. However, a channel can be saturated by communication. That is, you can only have one device communicating on a channel at a time or else they interfere with each other. Question number five. Does a router stop communication or allow communication to traverse the attached network connections? Choose the best answer. And the answer is actually C. It does both. It stops communication specifically related to broadcast traffic, meaning it keeps your network contained within your network. It doesn't just spill over to the other networks, but it allows communication that is specifically intended for the outside world. This is technically known as unicast traffic. And yes, routers do carve wood. Question number six, a computer would like to communicate with a server on the internet. When it sends communication requests out its network card, what destination MAC address would you expect to see in the header? Ooh, so tricky. The answer is actually B, the MAC address of the router. When you've got a computer plugged into a switch, that switch allows it to communicate with all the local devices that are plugged in. If the computer wants to leave the network, for example, to reach some internet server out there, it needs to send that communication to the router and yet specify that the server is what it's trying to reach. That's why we have two layers of addresses. The layer two address is what gets it to the local router. The layer three address, which most people call the IP address, is what says to the router, this is the final destination I'm trying to get to, at which point the router uses its routing table to get it there. On these other answers, the switch learns MAC addresses, but it's not the destination MAC address. The computer would have no reason to put itself as the destination, although it would be the source. 
And lastly, the computer has no way of figuring out what the MAC address of the server on the internet is. And even if it did have it, it's not connected to the switch that plugs into that server, thus it would never be able to reach it. And oh my goodness, I put the wrong title in there. That actually comes from the A-plus series. I was teaching A-plus hardware and I, for I forgot to change that. That is the right start time, but that should have said primary router functions. There you have it. Question number seven. Typically, most of the core network equipment for an office are stored in a secured and delightfully cooled location known as the... The answer is C, the Main Distribution Facility, or MDF. I was going to throw IDF on there, but I thought that would be too tricky. The LDF doesn't really exist. A rack room is a descriptive name, but that's not what people usually call it. <laughs> I've seen many networks be stored in a water closet, but they're not supposed to be there. <laughs> and a padded room is probably for the network engineers supporting networks that are stored in a water closet. Last one, question number eight. All the cables in an office usually run through the ceiling to a blank before connecting to the switches. The answer is C, patch panels. So you go into the walls of, of just about any building, you got the wall jack, right, that, that comes out here and plugs into the computers and everything else, right? Well, if you rip the walls out and actually look behind, the cable runs up typically into the uh, crawl space above, oh, what, uh, the plenum space. I don't know why that was slipping my, the, the plenum space above the ceiling. Here's your, your little, uh, you know, ceiling tiles right there. And then that comes down to the MDF or the IDF where all your network equipment is stored. It first plugs into a patch panel. As I said, it's a dumb device back in that series. And when I say dumb, I'm not like we all look and go, you're so dumb. I'm talking it's a physical device. It has no intelligence like a switch does. It just takes the cable on the back and gives you a port on the front that you run these little cables to to the switches. The reason it has that is because if you ran them straight to the switch, which you could, but then later wanted to move the switch to a different location, it is a nightmare. So the patch panel gives you kind of a little junction box, if you will, to easily work with the connections, plugging into what ports you want to on the switch without a lot of cable movement drama. You should now feel pretty good describing the equipment that supports every network in the world, that is, the switch, the wireless access point, and the router, and how it functions in a network environment. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing.